This gospel contains a line well known in English and used as a reason to be nice to children. But the Greek word translated child, paideon, in the phrase, and he took a little child and put it among them and taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me, does not mean child in the sense you and I speak of our children. Children in the first century were not regarded as they are today. Under the best of conditions for them, they were a means to increase a family's income. They were also an investment in the future so that they would take care of us in old age. Under ordinary conditions, they were tolerated. They were potential people, not people. So Jesus was not being like Mr. Rogers and reaching out to a cute and cuddly child and saying that to be Christian, we have to provide Sunday school to this cute and cuddly child. He was saying that to be Christian, we have to embrace this child which just attempted to steal our watch or wallet or rings or came with his or her parents illegally into this country or came illegally without parents into this country and to see Christ in that child. Jesus was saying that we are Christian when we love the unlovable. He is also saying that when we lose sight of the necessity for loving the unlovable, the church breaks down and falls into petty jealousies. Petty jealousies which escalate into the destruction of the church. The context in which we read about caring for children is in an argument over who among the apostles is most powerful. And there are many things that Jesus Christ's superstar gets wrong, but it does get this right. Always thought that I would be apostle, knew that they would, you know, so on and so on. Uh, Talk about me when I'm dead. Um, In response, Jesus redefines power by characterizing it as caring, genuinely caring for the powerless child. Of course, this is an anachronistic statement. There is every reason to believe that Jesus had no intention of founding a church. Jesus thought the world was going to end soon after Easter. However, we have the story from Mark. And Mark was writing to people struggling to become a church. So Mark has inserted it into the story of apostles vying for position, this story of welcoming all children. Is the church today discontinuous with the church in the first century. Some certainly believe so. We are not a persecuted minority, not even an ignored one. But too often we have become distracted by the accoutrements of power and our role in power and have lost sight thereby of the gospel. The reference to children is meant to remind us of what's important and position and power are not what matters in the gospel while, of course, they are crucial in our society. Should the church have opinions on the political crises of today? Should they be aired in the pulpit? Many of you know my answer. (laughs) And if in doubt, you will have noticed that I've referred to the crisis with children on our borders. It's an issue prominent in the secular press. We read and hear that children who arrived here illegally, whether with a parent or unaccompanied are being held under prison-like conditions. And even when not held under these conditions, they are separated from the parents who brought them. It seems that some of them can no longer be located, some of the children can no longer be located, making it impossible to reunite them with their parents, many of whom have already gone back to their country of origin. They are being treated as commodities of little value. Parents are warned that if they bring their child here, the child will be taken away. The government wants us all to know that, wants everybody in the middle in Latin America to know that. That's meant to discourage illegal immigration. We do the unthinkable to stop the hopeless, trapped in a reality we find incomprehensible. I am an American by accident of birth. I did nothing to earn or deserve it. I didn't have to come here. I was born here. Now, if we're a first century man or woman, we know that children are disposable. They are not precious. At best, they are a commodity. They are a burden. So, of course, society has nothing to do with taking care of illegal children. To think that it does is absurd. 
However, the church took a contrary position because Jesus said, as I read earlier, then he took a little child and put it among them and taking it in his arms, he said to them, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me. Jesus took a waif, an undocumented alien child, and said that welcoming that child is welcoming me. I'm glad to report that according to a column in the Times on Thursday, the Southern Baptist Convention, hardly known for liberal politics, and the National Association of Evangelicals are vocally protesting the policy of separating children from parents and also the policy of keeping solo children in isolation. And furthermore, they are calling for a path to citizenship. In this, they join the so-called mainline congregations, including us. As you may recall, our bishops and many delegates to our general convention in Austin last summer went to the border to protest how we're treating immigrants. So not to overplay the point, but if you want to find Jesus today, do not look for him in the halls of Congress. Do not look for him among the successful. Do not look for him among the content. Look for him in the eyes and being of the children we are treating so or permitting to be treated so inhumanely. Our willingness to be one with Christ is apparently measured by our care for them. This is a hard saying. It's an inconvenient saying. It challenges much of what many of us believe is true of what it means to be the church. Jesus means to challenge. It's lonely being the one who has to relate that to you. At one point in my life, I was a successful fundraiser. I know what must be said to get people to open their wallets and support a mission. And this is not the right formulation. However, if we're to be the church Mark was trying to form, in contrast to the culture all around him, then it is the core of who we are. There is a strong feeling in our culture that the church is most successful, whatever that means, when it affirms the majority culture and not when it challenges it. However, I believe we must always remember that when Jesus was crucified, he had been abandoned by everyone who cared for him. Jesus' ministry was a failure. Peter denies him. Judas betrays him. Thomas doubts him. No one expected a resurrection. The fishermen returned to their boats. Everyone scattered. The majority culture appeared to have won. But the risen Lord had faith in his disciples, although they had lost faith in him. The reality of the resurrection is that more people came to believe than had ever believed when Jesus was walking in their midst. The gospel thread spread throughout the world out of the ashes of defeat. From this we can believe that that which is folly to the world is not folly to God. Time and time again in holy history, God has worked with people who have reached a situation of total powerlessness. God says that God does this because if God can revive the totally powerless, the waifs and urchins of the church, the illegal alien kids, then there can be no doubt that it is a miracle performed by God. If Christianity can today become a voice proclaiming the expectations and love demonstrated in the gospel for the poor and the powerless, and especially the innocent poor and powerless like children, including especially those who have arrived here illegally, then Christianity will, will re have rediscovered its voice and reason for being. The tendency in the church is to seek approval from power. We want the biggest church, most active church, most creative Sunday school, highest pledges, and most powerful people in our community to belong. These are not bad things. But they are not unmixed blessings because we can easily confuse power with Christianity. Whatever power we have, according to the gospel, must only be exercised to change the condition of the poor and powerless, the sojourner in our midst, otherwise known as the illegal immigrant. When you and I are at the pearly gates and St. Peter quizzes us on our lives, he won't say to me, for instance, why didn't you quadruple the attendance in Westport? He will say to me, why weren't you faithful? Your life and the life of our parish 
will be measured by the degree it and we are faithful.